Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today, we will continue our overview of the book uh, Eurasianism and Ideology for the Multipolar World. And today, we will begin by analyzing the um, first part of uh, chapter two, the first section, which refers to the history of the classic Eurasianist movement, also known as early Eurasianist movement or classic Eurasianism. And we will understand, we'll try to understand what are the main features of this movement, where it appeared, how, who were the main protagonists. Uh, we already know that Eurasianism as a philosophical movement and a political program possesses a, wild, uh, a worldwide scope. It is not only a Russian phenomenon. Uh, it has been, there have been many manifestations of it in other countries, especially countries that have a Eurasian geographical and um, historical uh, nature. Think of, for instance, Kazakhstan or Turkey, and also some countries in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe. However, as we already said in previous meetings, we will focus mainly on Russian Eurasianism and how it manifested throughout time. So let's begin immediately with our analysis of early Eurasianism. To give it a time span, we can consider uh, early Eurasianism that ideology that begins after the uh, Bolshevik revolution of 1917 and uh, finds full um, development during the 1920s and then begins to decline and to gradually disappear in the 1930s. So the Eurasianist movement, known in Russian as Yevrasiskoye Dvizhenie, appeared first in the European intellectual context as an ideological and philosophical theory. Uh, this movement was shaped by a group of intellectuals, of literati, who belonged to the community of Russian émigré that fled the uh, Russian Empire after the advent of the Bolshevik October Revolution in 1917. And also after the, of course, the subsequent execution of the Romanov imperial family, as well as the outbreak of the gruesome civil war between the Reds and the Whites, and uh, also the interventionists that supported the Whites between 1917 and 1922. In this respect, we can say that Eurasianism represents a philosophy of exile, because it emerged among those members of the Russian intellectual community that had to leave the country after, after the advent of the Bolsheviks. Um, at the same time, we can say that Eurasianism has been conceived and nourished in a specifically European context. And that is something that we can see also in the methodological pattern it uses, because basically uh, Eurasianism as a political theory is shaped on um, European political philosophy, European political theory, and therefore uh, it, it bears the same hermeneutical patterns of other European philosophical doctrines. In this sense, we can say that it's a, philo it's a European philosophical doctrine, although uh, sometimes it, it wishes to um, represent itself as a non-European um, doctrine. Or, or a partial European doctrine, but it's a little bit like Marxism. Marxism appeared in Europe, it's a European doctrine, but it was applied elsewhere rather than in Europe in a more uh, decisive way. Since the very beginning, Eurasianist thought was strongly influenced by several cultural and political movements that also appeared in Europe, but uh, previously in the 19th century including uh, Slavophilism, Pan-Slavism, and also Orientalism. The Slavophiles uh, included uh, Alexei Komyakov, uh, Konstantin Aksakov, and Ivan Kireyevsky. And 
according to these authors, um, Rush, the Russian civilization bore a, a unique and original uh, character, which was basically the result of two fundamental elements. On one hand, the Slavic race, and on the other, the Christian Orthodox faith. And therefore, Slavophiles believe that the Russian culture should have stayed pure and also strived for defending and preserving its typical traits against Westernization, which according to Slavophiles in the Russian Empire had begun after Peter the Great's uh, and so-called enlightened reforms, uh, which attempted to modernize Russia and to make it uh, appear more European than it used to be in the past. Also, Slavophiles pro proclaim the value of tradition and also praise the greatness of the Russian imperial experience and also alleged that the introduction of Western models would have been leading Russian society to a rapid decay. Uh, on the other hand, Pan-Slavism was also a political movement and ideology that similarly to Pan-Germanism, uh, advocated for the political union of all Slavic peoples uh, into a single country. And finally, Orientalism uh, appeared as an academic discipline that included the uh, study of the, heart, of the art, history, linguistics, uh, uh, geography, um, ethnography of uh, Eastern cultures and of the Middle East, uh, North Africa, Southern Asia, Eastern Asia. However, once again, using a European methodological perspective and approach, though dealing with non-European um, elements. And one of the distinguishing traits of early Eurasianism was the idea that the Russian culture represented a peculiar civilizational combination with elements deriving both from the West and from the East. However, though belonging at the same time to the West and to the East, uh, Russia did not reduce itself only to one or to the other. Instead, the Russian civilization and culture had developed through history an original synthesis of both worlds. In this sense, the Russian people were to be considered neither European nor Asiatic, but instead uh, as belonging to an original Eurasian ethnic community with specific historical uh, identity and civilizational identity. Uh, also, Eurasianists bore uh, a millenarist and eschatological worldview uh, that led them to give a mystical interpretation and understanding of the revolutionary events of 1917. In other words, the Russian Revolution was conceived as an event of religious nature which, uh, thanks to the awakening and upheaval of the Asian masses of the Russian people, had succeeded in destroying the old bourgeois world imported by Western civilization, uh, unleashing the pursuit of new forms of social, cultural, and political organization against uh, the Western one. And so we can say that in a very interesting way, uh, Eurasianism, early Eurasianism, bore a twofold view of the Russian Revolution. Uh, on one hand, uh, it condemned Bolshevik materialistic progressivism and also the set of Marxist doctrines. But at the same time, on the other, it was pleased uh, to see the collapse of what was conceived to be the Westerner Romanov rule. Also being strongly influenced by idealism, early Eurasianists uh, held a very romantic vision of the history of Eurasia. In other words, the Eurasian continental landmass as a whole, including its European part, was perceived as the cradle from which very important and glorious empires of humankind had appeared, starting from the Macedonian Empire, uh, 
even before the Macedonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Macedonian Empire, the Roman Empire, and also eventually the Mongol Empire. And so uh, in this frame, um, Eurasianists believed that Russia was the continuer of two distinctive uh, imperial traditions. On one hand, it was the uh, continuer of the uh, Byzantine Empire's legacy due to the fact that Moscow was uh, perceived as the third Rome after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, when it was sieged and conquered by the Ottomans. And on the other hand, uh, Russia was also the continuer, the heir to uh, Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire, from which later the uh, Khanate of the Golden Horde had appeared. And so in this sense, this community of uh, emigre represented a, not a homogeneous group, a dishomogeneous uh, group of people with different political backgrounds and, diff and different ideo uh, ideological backgrounds. Uh, in, this, in this sense, they were uh, a community with intellectuals who belonged to monarchism, some were monarchists, some were conservatives, some were liberals, there were also socialists and some anarchists, but there were no communists. That was the only exception to the spectrum of uh, exponents of the political ideologies. And in this sense, we can say that there wasn't a clear cut uh, Eurasianist doctrine, but it, it it was the merging, it included, it comprised the merging of different ideologies into one, however, following the common pattern of believing in this um, Eurasian narrative. Uh, and the Eurasianist doctrine officially presented itself as a third way ideology that strongly rejected both communism on one hand, it was an anti-communist, ideology, but also Western liberalism, liberalism as interpreted by the West, so liberal democracy. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's also showed hesitancy in adhering to fascism. Mm, however, sometimes it took some elements from fascist ideologies, as it did from monarchism and socialism. As we already anticipated, classic Eurasianism was strongly influenced by the Russian idea of otherness in relation to the West. And so in the Romanov era of the Russian history was interpreted by Eurasianists as a, an era of forced Westernization of the Russian civilization, especially due to the reforms that were enhanced by Peter I and also Catherine, the, Catherine II, these two Tsars. Uh, and so instead, uh, Eurasianists believe in the, um, in the idea that Russia was a third continent between Europe and Asia. It was neither European nor Asian, but a specific and complex reality with its own specific specificities. And also uh, the Weltanschauung of the Eurasianist, of the early Eurasianist doctrine was often based on some reductivist and also Manichaean paradigms that divided the world into forces of good and evil, where the evil was incarnated at the time by the October Revolution and the Bolshevik regime. And instead the good was incarnated by the white movement and by those uh, forces in the early twenties that were fighting against the Reds, the Bolsheviks, in the former Russian Empire. In terms of their academic background, the early Eurasianists were also uh, people belonging to different, to different spheres of culture. Some were geographers, some linguists, philologists, and historians, some were theologians. There were also economists, ethnographers, and orientalists. So, uh, they, for instance, whereas geographers, ethnographers, and historians 
attempted to describe the Eurasian big spaces um, through the variety of the ethnicities that dwell there and also through the historical evolution of the pan-continent. Uh, on the other hand, linguists and philologists began to study and classify the various Eurasian languages and also their paleogenesis, whereas instead theologians focused on the study and of the reconstruction of the religions of Eurasia, uh, including some um, neglected religions like, for instance, shamanism and tengrism, through others that were, of course, much more studied and well known, like, for instance, Buddhism, Islam, or, of course, the same Christianity and Judaism. One thing all Eurasianists, early Eurasianists had in common, that they were all dissidents who opposed the demise of the Russian Empire and the advent of the communist rule. And so they were uh, sympathizers and um, supporters of the white faction during the Russian Civil War. And so they also supported the generals of the white faction, including uh, uh, Alexander Kolchak, Nikolai Yudenich, Lav Kornilov, Anton Dienikin, uh, Piotr Wrangel, Grigory Semyonov, and also, of course, the very famous Baron Roman von Ungern Sternberg, the famous uh, uh, Black Baron or crazy baron, according to some sources, that wanted to create this pan-Asian or pan-Eurasian empire, conservative empire, uh, that would have wiped out Marxism and the generations of the uh, modern civilization through the reconstruction of, the, of a conservative and traditionalist society. So let's consider more closely some of the main uh, early Eurasianists. Well, first of all, there was uh, Prince Nikolai Trubetskoy, who was a philologist, then the geographer Piotr uh, Savitsky, the com music composer Piotr Suvchinsky, the historian and theologian uh, George Florovsky, also the philosopher Liev Karsavin, the geopolitician George Vernadsky, the philosopher Nikolai Alexeyev, as well as the theologian Ivan Ilin, and also the linguist Roman Jakobson, the jurist uh, Mstislav Shakhmatov, uh, also the historian of literature Dmitry Zviatopol Mirsky, the orientalist Vasily Nikitin, the philosopher Yakov Bromberg, and finally, the historian Erenjen Karadavan. The first Eurasianist collection of articles was published in Sofia, in Bulgaria, in 1929 under the name Ischod Kavostoku, which means Exodus to the East. And basically, this collection, this publication was envisioned as a manifesto for the beginning of a new era of thought that could potentially reshape the nature of Russian identity and also discuss the future of what was then already Soviet Russia. And at that time, Eurasianism appeared as a modernist and avant-gardist movement. And so the Eurasianists were considered to some extent a new generation of Slavophiles who had embraced the era of uh, futurism. And so during the 1920s, we already said that the movement gained uh, momentum, it gained uh, an importance and influence in the European intellectual debate. Uh, the movement held seminars, lectures, conferences in several European capitals, including Paris, Brussels, Prague, and uh, Belgrade. Uh, they also, it also published a weekly newspaper known as Chronicle and also the literary journal uh, Versti. At the same time, some in Eurasianist intellectuals contributed to writing the pamphlet Put or Path, which was a literary organ of uh, Russian religious Orthodox thought. 
precisely in this uh, in this context, uh, the um, scholar uh, Zviatopolk Mirsky played an important part in spreading the knowledge of Eurasianist thought among exponents of Russian emigre literature groups. And after his uh, expatriation to Great Britain in 1921, also the beginning of his lectures on Russian literature at the uh, University of London, Zviatopol Kmirsky helped the Eurasianist movement to publish its works in journals and periodicals. And these uh, series of collected articles were published under the name of Eurasianist Annals, Yevrasiski Vremiennik. Also, uh, other pamphlets were gathered in the Yevrasiskaya Kronika, so you were the Eurasianist Chronicle distributed from 1925 to 1937. And then of course, single essays written by the intellectuals of the Eurasianist movement began to appear and to spread in the, in the academic and uh, literary debate. Publication that focused primarily on politics, history, religion, ethnography, and Oriental studies. Now let's consider uh, a little bit closer, one of the main exponents of the early Eurasianist movement, uh, namely Prince Trubetskoy. Uh, well, first of all, he was an academic, a linguist, as we, as we said already, and also an historian who taught um, in several universities. He started delivering lectures at the Moscow University, but then when the revolution broke out, he first moved to the south in the University of Rostov on Don, but then he left Russia and went to Bulgaria, where he worked at the University of Sofia. And finally, he took the chair of Professor of Slavic Philology at the University of Vienna in Austria. We can quote some of his main works, including Yevrasistvo i Bieloi Vigenie, which is Eurasianism and the White Movement. Europa i Cielowieczestwa, so Europe and man humankind, Ruskaya Problema, the Russian question, Nasledie Genghis Khana, Vzgliad na Ruskuyu Istoriu Nezapadas Vostoka, which is the legacy of Genghis Khan, a look at Russian history not from the West, but from the East. Also, Ke Problema Ruskova Samopoznania, which is on the problem of Russian self consciousness, as well as Historia Cultura Yazik, History, Culture, and Language. And also, he contributed in publishing several articles in the mentioned collection, uh, Ishod Kvestoku. Uh, of course, Trubetskoy considered the Slavs uh, as, a, as a folk, as an independent component of the Western world that like many Slavophiles had already done. Uh, and the Slavs would differ from both the Romans and the Germanic folks of the European stocks. And within the Slavic group, he believed that the Russians belonged both to Slavdom, but also to the realm of the steppes, because they were culturally and historically linked to the Turanian world, despite the uh, Slavic language that they spoke and the Christian Orthodox faith that they professed. And so in this sense, Russians uh, and other Eastern Slavs were very different from Western Slavs or from Southern Slavs. Uh, in the vast extension of the Russian Empire, Trubetskoy believed the Slavic and the Turanian elements were equally represented and throughout history had enjoyed uh, an equivalent importance. However, we can also understand that Trubetskoy was not uh, concerned mainly on genetic or racial kinship. Like for instance, as it was important for race theory in uh, European and American uh, academic environments. So race theory, concerned specifically on the phenotype on the racial characteristics and features of peoples was something that did not um, manifest in the early Eurasianist thought. 
And also this was one of the main reasons, for instance, why he would be persecuted by the Nazi regime in Austria. And so, whereas, for instance, contemporary intellectuals like um, Hans Gunther in Germany were uh, uh, building a racial scientific theory based on a sci somewhat scientific division of the races of men according to phenotype and to physical appearance as well as intellectual appearance. This was not something that just um, intellectuals like Hans Gunther did, but for instance, there was also an attempt by uh, Lothrop Stoddart in the US or Madison Grant in the US, as well as other intellectuals in Britain and France. Trubetskoy uh, uh, instead considered not the, the phenotypical characteristics as paramount, but instead much more the civilizational common uh, belonging and common interpretation of history. <clears throat> In other words, by affirming that cultural and linguistic affiliation could shape a group more distinctively than other variables like race itself, like phenotype, uh, Trubetskoy believed that Russia's topogenesis was entirely attributable to a Eurasian identity, which comprised both the Slavic and the Turanian identity. And in this sense, Trubetskoy had uh, thoroughly analyzed the Turanian world, that is the Ural Altai world, in the attempt of demonstrating this intimate correlation with the Russian Slavic one. And he believed to have found some solid interrelations between languages, cultures, and social political behavior of Eurasian peoples. Uh, for instance, he believed that the Turanian languages, that is Ural Altaic languages, for, spoken by the five ethno-linguistic groups of the Ugriks, the Samoyeds, the Turkics, the Mongols, and the Manchus, would explain the essence of Turco-Mongolic societies and also their intimate identity uh, that he called the Turanian subconscious philosophical system. And also Prince Trubetskoy believed that the substantial qualities of the Turanians would justify a natural inclination for an ideocratic and autocratic regime. In other words, the fact uh, that the, the typical, the characteristics, civilizational and historical characteristics of Turanians shaped also their political destiny and their statehood. And in the sense, as the natural continuer of the Mongol Empire, Russia would have had inherited this inclination towards ideocracy and autocracy, whereas the Europeanization of Russian society under the Romanov dynasty, especially Peter I and Catherine II, had weakened this natural predisposition towards autocracy and towards Eastern uh, ideocracy typical of Mongolic people. And also Trubetskoy believed in the unity of Eurasia, you know, in the geographical unity of uh, Eurasia, believing that the borders between Russian Eurasian civilization and the Asian cultures were imperceptible because there was a geographical continuity from one point to another of Eurasia that characterized the vast lands of this supercontinent. In other words, this supercontinent was joined together by mass, um, by a vast landmass of uh, steppes and uh, uh, forests that basically created a kind of common geographical environment that justified also similar political and civilizational interpretations and models. And in Europe and mankind, Trubetskoy denied the universality of the Western European model, denouncing also European colonialism and the imperialism of the European socioeconomic paradigm. 
And in this sense, the realization of Russia's Easterness was a logical consequence of the rejection of the Western liberal democratic paradigm. And in his works, Trubetskoy uh, attempted to rehabilitate the tyrannic element of Russian history, at the same time discarding the Eurocentric historiographical vision of Russia's history as a result of um, three, of just three epochs, that is Kievan Rus, uh, Moscovite Rus, and uh, the Roman of Russia. And so, in this sense, he exalted the historical epochs of Russian history, which were dominated by the Turanian element. Like, for instance, the period of the Mongol domination that occurred between the 30th and the 16th centuries, uh, which instead in European and Western sources is considered the period of the Mongol yoke in a negative way. In other words, in this regard, Eurasian history was the result of a composition of two elements, the Russian Slavic one and the Turanian Mongolic one. And the cohabitation and common sharing of historical destiny between Slavs and Turanians was the pivot of Russian history. And Trubetskoy also highlighted the importance of the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan for giving to Russia a specific identity, which he considered, which he considered a hidden identity. In other words, an identity that led to the belief that Eurasia had a distinctive geographical connotation and that a common rule over Eurasian lands was implied. In other words, through the imperial ideology inherited by the Mongols, Russia would have received a justification for its empire building and also a geopolitical vocation as a land power, a continental power, or a, in other words, a telluric power. We'll see this better when we'll talk about geopolitics and the division between sea and land in terms of power. Also, Trubetskoy deepened the importance of spirituality for the Eurasianist movement and also its, relation, its relations with the Eurasian re religions. For instance, Trubetskoy believed that the orthodox variety of Christianity was the main spiritual reference point for Eurasia. Instead, he viewed quite skeptically other Asian religions for instance, Confucianism was considered too pragmatic and rational. Islam professed by Central Asian Turkic peoples uh, was blamed for having disfigured the ancient religions of the Turanic people, uh, which was basically focused on shamanism or Tengrism. And instead, Buddhism was perceived, was perceived as a passive a too passive religion because of its implicit opposition to reality and the renunciation of the world. And at the same time, Hinduism was criticized because it justified the creation of an unchanging and static society based on the caste system, which was incompatible with uh, uh, the freedom that could come, according to Trubetskoy, from the Orthodox faith. And this is uh, enough for Trubetskoy. Let's move to Piotr Savitsky. Piotr Savitsky was a geographer, but also an economist and a philosopher. And uh, among his main works, we can quote Russia i Latinstva, which is Russian Latindom, but also Vorbeza Yevrasistva in struggle for Eurasianism, and also continent Eurasia, continent Eurasia. Uh, Savitsky is mainly famous for the development of the so-called theory of topogenesis. This is a very important geographical theory, very much influenced by geographical determinism. Uh, 
And according to the theory of topogenesis, uh, there would be a strong link, almost mystical, between territory and population. Uh, in other words, the geographical environment would be one of the chief factors for the rise of specific civilizations and also for the development of their culture and history. In other words, history and territory are intertwined and the historical outcome of populations would rest on the geographical variables of the land that people inhabit, influenced by climate, soil, orography, flora, uh, fauna, weather, waterways, and so on. And so in a similar fashion to what Ratzel, Friedrich Ratzel does in, in early geopolitical thinking, we'll see that later, uh, Savitsky agrees that geography is a living organism that interacts entirely with the peoples that it hosts, determining their specific characteristics. And this, of course, leads to the fact that there should be um, interaction and communication between the sphere of the nature and social political environment. In other words, state and nature should interact and be connected one with another. Also, Savitsky contributed to the development of the discipline of geosophy, that is that branch of geography that analyzes territory, not only as an ordinary object related to natural sciences, but as a valuable part of human history, culture, and national identity. And according to geosophy, uh, territories possess a metaphysical and philosophical value, and also soils can explain the hidden meanings of civilizations. And within the frame of geosophy, Savitsky believed that the territory of the Eurasian landmass justified a natural unification under a single rule. Eurasia possessed a geometric and systemic nature from one area to another, and this natural homogeneity implied a political unification. In other words, Eurasia could benefit from its natural borders and the natural borders of the supercontinent were uh, on one hand, the Atlantic Ocean and on the other side, the Pacific shores. And Savitsky believed in the existence of four horizontal strips that divided Eurasia from North to South, creating a, a clear, some clear uh, climatic and uh, geographical distinctive habitats. First of all, there was the tundra, then the taiga, then the steppe, and finally the desert. And three major plains intersected transversely these strips. Uh, the plain between the White Sea and the Caucasus, the Siberian plain, and finally, the plain of Turkestan, Central Asia. And in this scheme, the steppe strip can be considered as Russia's geopolitical core. Throughout history, this strip served the purpose of permitting the Russian penetration and colonization of Eurasia, playing a very similar role to the one the ocean waves had for the Western European sea powers while conquering the Indies and the Americas. As we will see in later uh, events, Sir Halford Mackinder gave a very similar interpretation to Russian eastward penetration, comparing it with the European geographic discoveries of the 15th and 16th centuries, when he describes the difference between the landsman point of view and the seaman's point of view. Uh, and thanks primarily to the role of the Cossacks uh, as Siberian pioneers and settlers, the Russian rule over the vast Eurasian landmass that extends from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean made uh, the project of a potential unification of Eurasia a reality. 
Uh, at the same time, the steppes granted to Russia many aspects of its specific identity, including a continentalist inclination, so a telurocratic mindset, but also the idea of an extensive space to subdue, a predisposition towards economic outer key, and the stark mentality projected towards political isolationism and autocracy, if we want, as well as the need for geographically controlling the pivotal heartland. And we will consider further the concept of heartland when we'll be dealing with geopolitics and with the importance of some geopolitical theories vis-a-vis -vis Eurasia. And so history and geography explain to Russia that who controlled the steppes could potentially become the political unifier of Eurasia. In this sense, Russia's territorial expansion was the natural expression of its identity on, on, and of its intrinsic imperial structure. Also, Savitsky stressed the cultural and geographical closeness of uh, Eurasian peoples and nations, highlighting how the Russian ethnographic uh, character was basically a mix of three uh, phenotypes, that is the Slavic, the ugro finnic and the Tatar-Mongolic one. Finally, uh, Savitsky admired also the uh, Mongol period of Russian history, considering it as the founding moment of the expression of the uniqueness of Russian cultural uh, identity. And since the time of the Mongol dominion, Savitsky argued, the Russian state gained legitimacy through religion and also absorbed the Mongolic principles of statehood, combining them with its own Byzantine theological and political traditions uh, through to Kiev and Rus. Moving on to Roman Jakobson, we can say that being a friend with uh, Prince Trubetskoy, he was also a structural linguist. And we can quote his book, Kakaraktaristike Yevrasiskova Yazikova, Yazikova, sorry, Yazikovaya Sayuza, which is for the characteristics of the Eurasian Union of Languages. And through this book, what did he do? We basically tried to demonstrate the unity of Eurasian languages. Uh, interestingly, being fully aware of the uh, different linguistic families uh, that were present in Eurasian languages, for instance, the Indo European, Ural Altai, Caucasian, and so on, he still believed that the Eurasian languages shared a common way of interpreting the surrounding geographical environment despite the different uh, paleogenesis, phylogenesis, if we want. Uh, and in this sense, Jack Jacobson claimed that uh, in the study of linguistic uh, families were important, but the um, even more importantly was the place development where the language had developed even more than the phylogenetic closeness. Moving to Vernadsky, George Vernadsky was a Russian-born American historian who wrote also numerous books on Russian history. We can quote Nacertanya Ruskoi Histori, Inscription of Russian History, uh, Opit Histori Evrazi, Experience of the History of Eurasia, Drevnia Yarus, Ancient Russia, Mongoli Rus, the Mongols and Russia, Russia, Israelinia Vieka, Russia in the Middle Ages, Ruska Historiographia, so Russian historiography, etc. And Vernadsky in all these books highlighted the importance of Eurasian nomadic cultures for the cultural and economic progress of Russia as a state and as a civilization. Uh, he also paid great attention to Eurasian historical evolution. And he believed that the demise of the Turco-Mongol world 
after Tamerlane's death had led to Russia's appropriation of the leadership in the Eurasian continent after the fall of the Timurid Empire. And finally, we can quote Erenjen Haradavan, a very interesting uh, academic who was of Kalmuk uh, nationality. We know that these Kalmuks are basically uh, Mongols that relocated in the Northern Caucasus region uh, and that they still profess Buddhism. They're probably the only people that consistently as a nation profess Buddhism in Europe. And so this Kalmyk um, was one of the main uh, critics towards uh, Eurocentrism, addressing the great importance to the cultures of the peoples of the Orient, and especially to the nomadic cultures, contrasted with the uh, cultures of the settlement. His main work was a report of Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire and was published in Serbian and Serbo-Croatian under the name Genghis Khan, Kak Polkovodiec i Ego Nasledne. So Genghis Khan as commander and his legacy. And Karadavan, and unlike uh, many historians, stressed the importance of a nomadic way of life against the sedentary one. He believed in the cult of uh, nomadism. He condemned the sedentary and urban way of life, which would have led to the degeneration of men, of modern men. And he also believed uh, cities and urban life corrupted and um, unhealthy. On the other hand, the nomadic life would be healthy, vigorous, it would help people to be and to build a strong relation with nature, to interact with nature and with the surrounding environment. Uh, and also, interestingly, Karadavan stressed that the Mongol Empire bore a universal character, which was later inherited by Russia, of both Western and Eastern nature, because the Mongol hem Empire had been the arbiter and mediator between the Indo-Chinese world and the Mediterranean world. And therefore, it gave unity to the Eurasian lands. So these were the main uh, advocates of early Eurasianism. We have analyzed them quite uh, quickly due to time. But what we have to understand is that these people were mainly, were very active mainly in the 1920s, as already said. Um, however, the consolidation of the communist power in Russia and the birth of the Soviet Union in 1922 promoted a division of the Eurasianist movement into two parts. Uh, on one hand, there was a faction that was based in Prague, uh, which was hostile to the Soviet Union. And another one instead was located in Paris, the so-called uh, Clamart current, uh, which was much closer to the Soviet regime and published the Marxist uh, weekly uh, Eurasia, Eurasia, which has mar had Marxist inclinations in the sense, uh, as opposed to the, the um, Prague faction of Eurasians, which was more conservative and monarchist. And the Clamart current, though mainly made up of socialists, uh, condemned the founding fathers of Eurasianism who were perceived as nationalistic, right-winged, and instead claiming that Eurasianism should have been perceived more as a Marxist doctrine, close to Marxism, and should have finally opened itself to the Russian Revolution, seeing it positively because actually it would have uh, forged a more equal society closer to the Eurasian natural order. And this current wish to institutionalize the Eurasianist uh, movement in a political party based on the principles of Bolshevism as founded by Lenin and Trotsky. However, the 1930s were years that um, 
saw a decline, a significant drastic decline in the importance of the movement throughout uh, Europe. Why? Mainly because there were other ideologies and political forces that were uh, much more predominant in the time in European countries, especially fascism. Uh, fascism and its variants, its many variants, was prevailing in many countries, starting from Italy, of course, when in 1922, uh, Benito Mussolini uh, over, uh, overthrew uh, the previous government and became prime minister of Italy enhancing the fascist revolution in, in Italy. And from then on, other um, fascist movements started to appear almost everywhere in Europe, in, um, basically in all European countries, with more or less lucky, um, a lucky future. But as uh, the as fascism was becoming uh, the prevailing ideology in, um, in in many European countries, or at least the prevailing alternative ideology compared to, let's say, liberal democracy, Eurasianism consequently started to decline as an intellectual and political movement, and finally faded away from the European scenario. Let's say that by 1935 the movement had almost disappeared or at least it was completely negligible. The outbreak of World War II symbolized the end of early Eurasianism, whereas Marxist Eurasianists turned back to Russia, specifically to, the so to what was now the Soviet Union. Others like Jakobson and Florovsky left Europe for the United States. Trubetskoy, Prince Trubetskoy had died a few months before the outbreak of the conflict, persecuted by the Nazis, and Savitsky remained isolated in Central Europe. Uh, so basically, we can say that the, Eura the classic Eurasianist doctrine disappeared because of two much stronger, if we want, political ideologies. On the one hand, fascism, and on the other, communism. Thank you very much for being with me. Next time, we'll continue this analysis of the evolution of the Eurasianist movement and doctrine, specifically focusing on a key figure, namely Liev Gumilyov. Thank you, and see you next time. Bye.